Hey everybody, Chris Joslin again, your host for Jaws Bites. We're coming to you today with a, another special guest, a reoccurring special guest, Jennifer Joslin. She's going to be joining me today as we go and answer a few of your questions out there, some of the comments that have come in over the course of some of our video and podcasts. And we'll take a look at those, we'll try to respond to them, and hopefully we will not produce more questions, but actually have some answers for you. So welcome to our first mailbag episode. So welcome everybody to the first edition of Mailbag. I don't know if we're going to call it that or not, but I thought it was kind of a cool thing to start looking at some of the responses we've gotten both online and on our website and, and actually a couple via via calls after somebody's wanting to contact ilovelogistics.com, which should be running across your screen right now. By the way, we are sponsored as always by ilovelogistics.com, an aggregated news website dedicated to the transportation industry, not just the big guys out there. Certainly, if you have a career in logistics and you're trying to learn more about logistics, this is a great place to come and get your data bytes, get your Road Scholar information, see videos, listen to audios, podcasts, etc. But we want you to be part of the community. And some of the responses we're getting from the community of people that are watching some videos and listening to podcasts, we thought we'd take a few minutes today and, and the two of us, Jennifer Joslin and myself, your host, Chris Joslin, would sit back and kind of go through the mailbag a little bit and, and see what's out there and how we can respond. And, and if we get a good response from folks like yourselves, we'll do it very often and, and maybe have a coffee on Friday and get through some of this and see if there's some, some good stuff to dig into. So let's, uh, well, hi, by the way. Good morning, Jennifer. How are you? Good morning. How are you doing? How are you doing? Oh, it's been a long week. I'm ready for the weekend. How about you? Of course, transportation. Is there really weekends? I don't know. I mean, it's it's easier than ever to, like I've been saying before, park it on the couch on a Saturday night and be like, oh, I can nail out some of these tasks that I could wait till Monday to do. But Yes, yeah. can I actually do them while watching a, a, an entire series on Netflix, right? <laughs> Yeah, and I've been guilty of that before. However, uh, things are things are opening up, it seems like, in, in most places, at least somewhat. So, I mean, I'm kind of looking forward to a happy hour or two soon. Okay, I, I got to ask you before we get into this, though. Is there something special that you're watching on TV that you can share Ooh. on one of these, one of these streaming services? Because God knows, I would imagine you don't have any kind of regular cable TV or anything like that anymore. I mean, you are a millennial, right? I am a millennial, am which a means millennial, which I've means never paid for cable in my life, but I've probably paid for <laughs> double what cable costs and the Seems amount of streaming me, services. In the past, I think your father probably paid for your cable anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I, I have, um, we, we have about every single streaming service under the sun. So, I mean, it's basically cable all over again, but something I'd recommend, and I, I mean, I'm, I, I enjoy TV. What can I say? I love cinema if I want to be a little classy about it. Classics? But... <laughs> the old classics or stuff that is new? Uh, uh, I like the classics, but something I've seen that's new that was just good old fashioned fun TV or fun, uh, fun movie, like a blockbuster hit that didn't get, you know, a hundred on Rotten Tomatoes, but didn't tank either. It was just, you know, good escapism. Uh, we watched a movie called Greenland on HBO. Oh, I watched that the other day, too. <laughs> There's nothing like yeah. the world ending to get your juices flowing, right? Oh, I know. It's just, it, it, it frees your mind from the real, the real <laughs> world ending situations that we seem to be <laughs> looking yeah. at every you know, day I watch, these days. I, wa I hate to say this. I hate to even admit it, but I watched that movie and I was thinking, I wonder how they transported all the goods they needed for the time they were going to spend in Greenland. I wonder what yeah. transportation companies. It, it's so funny you say it, that because kinda... that was the same exact. I mean, when I, when I watch a movie, you know, it's usually just my partner and I, and we just like to go back and forth the whole time, asking the silliest questions. But you know, 
there are loopholes in these movies. So we were going back and forth about how on earth are they getting all this to the bunkers and how if this family shows up and they weren't on the manifest, there's not enough supplies to uh, keep everyone alive for a certain amount of time. I don't want to spoil the movie too much, but um, there were some loopholes, but it was a, it was a, I mean, it was a, fun, a good fun movie. Escapism and <laughs> yes. But I, you know, anyway, lots, lots of fun, but we, we can know, talk I, supply I chain about the, movies all the time. You know, you I, can see it. I agree. It's like, what are they doing? How are they doing it? Are they moving at full truckload, LTL? Are they going air, ocean? Right. Oh, you know, what are they doing? Yeah. And of course, today, I saw a little article today going through my eye level daily, which we, by the way, suggest greatly that you go and subscribe to because you'll get a daily email it's great. of aggregated it's stuff. And there's some great, and it's not just transportation. It's kind of stuff that is tangential to transportation that, that we as a, as a, a civilization out there need to know about infrastructure plans, things like that. And, and I saw an article today about how there's like 70 barges backed up on the Mississippi because yes. of that big crack that's in the, mm -hmm. I, I think that that latest, latest data bites that's going up probably today, tomorrow, something like that on the site, shows a picture of that bridge uh, near Memphis that goes across the Mississippi with a giant crack in it. My God. Crazy. I mean, just the littlest anyway. things, the smallest things like that can just create the biggest hiccup. I mean, you go back to the the um, Suez Canal and the and the Ever Given, you know, I know that was a hot topic for a lot of people the first time they were really considering, you know, there's a hiccup somewhere in the supply chain and it affects everywhere. You know that, you know, that ship's still there, right? Did you know yeah. that? That's yeah. still there. I forget the name. There's a kind of crazy name of the lake that's attached to the canal there. Oh, Bitter Lake or something yeah, like that. Yeah, I, I, I and, don't remember. And it's still there. I mean, the, the whole thing, it's 20,000 TEUs on that, full of cargo that's rotted or whatever. There's DEA agents. There's, oh, I mean, it's it's kind of incredible what they what they went through to get that thing done. And they're holding it with, with like storage charges, I'm sure, right? There's someone getting charged a lot of money to keep that thing housed in that lake. Well, you know, Evergreen, the company Evergreen owns that. And uh, uh, they are going to owe the government of Egypt just ungodly amounts of money, and oh, yeah. and other entities that help to pull that thing back around and straighten it up and tug it into the right direction. It's it's kind of crazy, but but to your point, our entire network, our entire supply chain, and I, I love that name. Whoever came up with the name originally, supply chain for stuff that comes all the way from from earth to finish good, you know, there's that whole chain of events that has to occur a lot of middlemen, a lot of different things that have to happen to raw materials to turn them into something that you and I are going to go out to the store and buy someday. Right. And mm -hmm. th that supply chain is only as good as it's quote unquote weakest link. And when these, these anomalous things come up like the Suez Canal or this, this bridge, that has got a crack in it now that's jamming up the Mississippi river. Those things create a lot of havoc downstream. So to speak, a of lot. The Mississippi River or upstream. No, you're totally or whatever. right. Yeah, Crazy. but hey, but you know, we're kind of going off on a tangent, but that's that's okay. I mean, this is this is really about disseminating information for people out there that are willing to listen and, and watch and learn, and you know, that's that's kind of our goal. And we've had some feedback in the last uh, uh, week or so, and we grabbed a couple of those. And let's take a look here. I'm glancing up at a. a uh, an online thing here so there's some so you want to dig into the mailbag you want to look at a couple of things see if it's something sure. you and i can can answer or we can go pass i don't know, you know so the, <laughs> let's the see first if we can tackle some of these here, i'm sorry what was that well yeah let's let's go ahead let's tackle some of these okay so the first thing that i see on here um is from somebody named kimberly and it says from madison i would assume that's probably Wisconsin, I, I guess. I guess, I don't think that's a last name. But in any event, uh, it says Madison, and it's, this one's specifically to you, Jen. So, oh, Jennifer, how do you deal with vendors that demand payment on ad bills, accessorials, things like that, that I think is what she's talking about, without real proof that they completed whatever they're billing for? It's kind of a broad question, but it's, you know, it's something I'm, pretty sure you deal with on an everyday basis. Oh, of course. Anyone anyone in this industry who has to deal with 
collecting or paying has to, you're going to put up with this at some point. Um, well, first off, if you can, you want to get ahead of this by making very clear up front before you begin your business relationship, what is expected when you're being billed something. Um, I know that we have like a, like a packet that we provide to our vendors when we first initiate any sort of business relationship about what is expected from them, both on the invoice and included with the invoice. So for example, just, just for a general, I don't know, repositioning move or something like that. You would say, okay, on the invoice, I need obviously your invoice number, the date, um, the, the reference number that we give you with our rate confirmation sheet or our dispatch, the uh, trailer number, the VIN number on the trailer. Um, basically, it also it also does a lot of good to get with your customer and see what they require from you when you bill them. So you can also pass along those requirements to your vendor because the last thing you want to do is be caught in the middle between a customer that requires one thing and you didn't require that from your vendor. And your vendor looks at you and says, you didn't ask for that up front and now we gotta dig through all this information. We performed the move, we did what you said that we needed to, to do to bill you. And then you end up fighting a little bit, usually a little bit well, of a I think, tip. You know, it's interesting because I think this Kimberly person has a, a really, she's, it's kind of a surface question, but it's it's really kind of at the heart of what we do, right? I mean, at, at the end of the day, the vendor wants to collect from us, and we want to collect from our customer. And to do mm -hmm. that, and, and in this case, she's talking about ad bills, so it's there's probably some kind of base rate or quote that was put out that has got the normal right. amount of stuff, and then everything extra, you got to have some kind of trail of information so that we, we can get paid and that we can pay properly, right? So set expectations is what you're exactly. really saying. I, uh, I would say with an accessorial bill specifically, so say you have, again, you have like a, a drayage amount that you have agreed upon. For the case of an example, you have $300 drayage amount along with fuel for the amount of miles. So let's say that's another $50 or something like that. So 350 is the general basis of what you should uh, be expecting to be billed for. Well, let's say that this company did a yard pull, um, but they didn't let you know about it. So they bill you for that yard pull and you go back and forth about how can you even prove to me that you did this, you didn't ask about it. So from the perspective of somebody who is billing a customer, in that case, I always tell our operations team, for example, any agreement you make, have it in writing, whether on email specifically. And what I will usually have my team do is we actually just take those emails as PDFs and we will use that when we're billing the customer saying somebody on your team or you specifically had agreed to pay this amount over email, whether you did a, a rate dispatch or not. Better yet, it is definitely advised if you are in a situation where you can get the rate confirmation sheet revised to actually have that amount on it, of course that's better. But um, bottom line is you don't wanna make an agreement over the phone with someone because I can almost guarantee it won't be followed through or it'll be a nightmare to get it followed through. And, and yeah, I will tell you in my career, I've made too many, you know, kind of handshake conversation over a table or over the phone and you know, I can't say they all went south. There's a great, there's awesome people out there that remember things, but putting something on in writing, and in this case, electronic communication of some kind, to have yourself a trail of information is hugely important. I think to, to her question, you know, as you just said a minute ago, you got to set the expectations properly. You got to understand the expectations from your customer, set the expectations properly with your vendor, have a, a mutual agreement on that, and then when something is outside of those parameters, then there has to be real significant communication trail. Because at the end of the day, if somebody bills us $100 and we agree to it without allowing our customer to agree to it, then we're setting ourselves up for losing $100, right? Right, exactly. And, um, and, and say you're in a point where you didn't make these upfront requirements for whatever it may be, or there's some accessorial that 
what for whatever reason you're having a difficult time with a vendor who's demanding payment for something that they can't necessarily prove and okay first example let's say someone on your team did do an email approval and you didn't know and sometimes you just gotta you gotta take the hit you know if you if someone on your team makes a mistake it's not fair some to the to the vendor who was under the impression that a representative from your company made this approval. That's that's not always the case, but that is sometimes the the leadership, the, the thing you have to do in, as a company is just take the hit. Other times, um, let's just say someone couldn't prove uh, there was a proof of delivery or something and you didn't make that requirement with them. I think that's a pretty standard expectation, but let's say, they billed you, you, you uh, didn't pay them in 30 days if that was your agreement. And they're saying, well, we gave you the invoice 30 days ago, we need payment now. We've dealt with vendors like that, these uh, usually much larger companies that have the that have the power to be able to demand payment like that, or maybe your customer demands payment for certain requirements, whatever. But in that case, you have to start looking towards claims, you have to look towards you couldn't prove this was delivered i have no proof it was delivered i'm going to assume this is a missing trailer or a missing product that will usually get someone's attention to get you uh what you need <laughs> that get them off no one really seat, likes right? dealing with no one very few people i won't say no one because maybe there's some person out there who just loves claims i don't know it's not me but it's not me but uh Usually when you go that route, that does get the attention. Uh, I, I would recommend avoiding that route by just upfront making your requirements very clear and also making sure your customer makes their requirements very clear with you. Right. So that yeah. way you can I, move I, that I down think, the line. Uh, I think what you're, you're really talking about is focusing in on, you know, standard operating procedures and communication lines and just clarity yes. of process really. And, you know, I know that a lot of small companies, especially that, that watch this, are going, God, there's so many details in all this stuff. And it's as simple as I'm going to send a bill and I need to collect it. So one of the things that's, that's always been nice about smaller niche companies, I think, is that you try to get enough margin in what you do, some specialty thing that you do, where if there are places you can be flexible and as you said a moment ago take the hit you're going to be able to absorb something for the long-term benefit of your relationship with the customer and the vendor so those are all things to consider um uh kimberly and but we appreciate the the question i hope that uh, we didn't muddy the waters for you i hope we cleared up a little bit of that but bring more feedback to us anytime and we'll try to continue to clarify i think what jennifer is basically saying though is Set your expectations both with your, your vendor and your customer and then follow through on a process that's very clear in terms of communication. That way, when what you bill, whether it's an initial baseline quote or whether it's some kind of ad bill accessorial kind of scenario, you will have documentation that'll get you paid. It may not be paid on time, but it gets you paid. And that's, that's the goal. I suspect that this person is in accounting or some kind of customer service you know, uh, position that uh, requires her to do these kinds of things. Let's jump mm -hmm. into the next one here. This one is from Antonio from Freno. I, it's got to be Fresno, California. Fresno? Freno. Yeah. I don't know if I Fresno. heard Freno, but but thank you for the question, Antonio. And it says uh, here, uh, I work in a warehouse here, I assume Fresno, and we are always talking about lowering our warehouse emissions during team meetings. Uh, I watched your video on indirect source rule. This was, I don't remember which episode that was, episode two, three, four, something like that. Early one. It says, do you think <laughs> that will become law? How can that be legal? Well, that's a good question. And how would they enforce such a thing? Boy, that's a, there's probably enough in that question that, that we could take a whole podcast to go over or write another Road Scholar article or something. So I won't get into it. I don't think in too much depth in Jen, I'll, I'll try to grab this one because I did a little bit of study up on, on this for that podcast previously. And mm -hmm. I, I will tell you this, the, the challenge right now is that that rule is becoming 
um, I wouldn't say law because it doesn't become a law, it becomes a requirement. The uh, South County um, Air Quality Management District, the SCAQMD, is the one that put this together. And this, is, this has been an ongoing kind of revised rule now for about three years, and there's 600 and something pages involved with this, these documents. But what it comes down to is it's a continual drive by all the California Air Resource Board entities out there to push the continual um, lowering of, of the carbon footprint. And if you, if you look at studies over the years, you'll see that the, the, one of the main drivers in the LA Basin, Southern California in general, is the, uh, the, the Class A trucks. The large trucks going in and out of ports, going in and out of rail terminals, going in and out of warehouses. So the indirect source, for, for years and years, there have been rules around warehousing, especially large warehousing uh, supply chain uh, entities that, that are either swinging freight from the harbor or bringing stuff in for distribution, whatnot, uh, 100,000 square feet or more. And there's a lot of giant warehouse in the Inland Empire here and in, down near the harbor, etc. And for years, there have been uh, something called, these warehouses have had to watch what they call their wear points. These are points they can accumulate on a year-to-year -year basis. I think they go June to June to May every year to calculate this, and these these are uh, warehouse action and investment to reduce emissions. I believe that's what WARE stands for. W A I R E. And the whole idea behind that is that you have to change your light bulbs, you have to watch your propane emissions. If you have your own fleet of trucks in there, they're you know a yard goat or something that's moving stuff around. You have to to start driving carbon out of your system. And it's monitored oftentimes in these large warehouses by a, a monitoring station that collects particulate data and ozone data on upwind and downwind sides of warehouses. That's how they calculate this stuff. And there's a whole cadre of people that are going through and reporting all this and everything else. But what that's a long answer to the first part of it. So warehouses have had to do these wear points forever. I don't know how long actually I say forever. But now this indirect source rule, which is very aggressive, now says if you're a warehouse and you're 100,000 square feet or more, or if, you're, if you have 100,000 square feet in a giant million square foot warehouse that you manage and it's owned by someone else, you have to watch who's coming in and out of your facility and you have to monitor their emissions in such a way that you can accumulate either additional wear points, trying to force trucks to be either near zero or zero, you know, NZE or ZE emission trucks, near zero emission or zero emission trucks. So, and, and those are becoming more and more popular, of course, you know, the, the harbors of our, the harbor terminals have already driven uh, engine changes and, and things to that effect. But that's what it is. It's, it's, it's talking about fugitive emissions, emissions that leave your warehouse space. Now though, they're making the warehousemen control people that are outside their, their sphere of influence. The repercussion of that and, and why I'm taking so long to talk about this is that if you're an outside trucking company, which is probably the people we're speaking to the most, you now are going to have to watch who you're, what warehouses you're going into because the larger ones are going to force this regulation, because that's what it is, not a law, it's a regulation. They force this regulation on you. So if you have a certain carbon footprint, if you're not smart way certified, for instance, or, or if you're not trying to drive potential of your trucks to zero emissions or near zero emissions, then you may be excluded from going into these warehouses at some point. Because the warehouseman is either going to be penalized by the carbon you're emitting on their facility, or they're going to get points for driving, driving carbon down. So which do you think they're going to try to do? So enforcement is the issue, though. I, I think that's a, a nice tail end that Antonio is. Whoops, let me turn that off. I've got a call coming in that I'll have to deal with later. But um, the, 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 the enforcement part is always the challenge, you know. 
the speed limit, speed limit on the highway is 65 miles an hour typically. Uh, if you're on the highway today in Southern California going 65, somebody's going to run you over, right? So, so it's one thing to have regulations. It's one thing to have laws. It's another thing entirely to to uh, have some 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 enforcement of that. In the way that the uh, South County um, Air Quality Management District is trying to have this happen, is to have the warehousemen actually that are being penalized supply the, the dollars for that entity to supply the monitoring to take care of it. So it's something we're not going to be able to really get around very easily. These these things, this data collection is going to be be a retrieval. It's not going to be a forced collection by some outside entity. It's going to be a retrieval that the warehouse will either do or they'll end up paying some penalty. And a lot of them will end up paying the penalty. They'll make a calculation and say, okay, we, we're getting penalized this amount of money and we're going to just pay it. Anyways, that was a great question, Antonio, from Freno, Fresno. Um, and I hope we answered that properly. I, I believe now that this is actually becoming an actual regulation and not just, I think it was called, proposed right PR 2305 it's probably actually R2305 now and I, I probably will come out with another discussion around that uh, for a full podcast at some point um, we've got another one here and this is from a Ryan it says Garner I'm not I, I'm well I know of one Garner and that's in Kansas but there may be maybe others can Garner Kansas is very interesting though they have a it's going to say a new rail terminal but it's probably about six or seven years old there if that if that's the one we're talking about and it says i've been working home for for over a year now uh, this might be right up your alley jen it says like most of the customer service teams where i work i miss the group and the atmosphere i i assume he's talking about at an office i mean listening to the homework podcast which you are on jennifer um I thought you might be able to add more or at, I thought you might have more to add since then about working from home, I assume. And so ha, how are you dealing with it? Is, is it still going the way you want? Do you, do you recognize that it's kind of an individual's preference thing or what do you think companies are thinking about this whole at home situation? I do think it's a preference thing. I, I have people I know who can't wait to get back to work and I know lots of people who have no desire to go back. They, in fact, some of their companies are saying, hey, we're gonna need you back in the next couple of weeks and they're fighting it <laughs> actively. <laughs> they're like, I do not wanna go back. So I Might really think it's a preference thing. fuel expecting that too, who knows? Um, yeah, there's, there's lots of, there's lots of reasons why I, uh, I do think it's just a preference for the person, but also it also depends on what your work environment's like. If Ryan here had a really great atmosphere at work, it's a shame that that's been, you know, kind of ripped away from him. But there's lots of people who didn't have a very great atmosphere at work who I, I just, uh, not me personally, but I know somebody uh, close to me who had a, a really difficult atmosphere at work and she is just it, does not want to go back and her company's telling her hey it, the, <laughs> we're gonna go back within the month and she does not want to go back at all so it just really depends on the situation um for me personally i don't mind it i don't see me going back anytime soon because we actually uh, my office which was a smaller like offshoot office where we were just doing a lot of admin stuff there was no drivers or or anything on on premise there we actually, our lease was up during the summer of last year and we didn't renew it because our team, which is, uh, you know, it's not necessarily the norm, but we worked well um, in a remote situation. We were able to still communicate and get our job done and find effective ways to, you know, manage that under the circumstances. And it's been Great so far. I don't know what the future holds necessarily um, in, in terms of where we'll be, you know, a year from now. But I know for the rest of the year, I think it's pretty, uh, I think we're pretty sure we're, we're not going back into an office. But it's really, it's, it's just preference, I think. And I feel for the people who want to go back and can't and for the people who are able to get their job done at home. And, and there's all sorts of reasons why it's not easy to go back. There's 
there's still a level of discomfort, I'm sure for a lot of people with being in an office environment, just considering COVID-19 things. But then there's also the price of gas. A lot of people, maybe their kids are not back in school yet and they they don't know what to do when it comes to childcare. Um, I I know I know someone who sold their car during all of this because they had no reason for it anymore and they were able to pay off a couple things and now they don't have a vehicle. So they're like, I do not want to go back. How am I going to get to work anyway? So there's a, there's all sorts of yeah, personal I, I, reasons. Involved. I got to imagine it's really depends on the type of work you do as well. You know, obviously there are of things that you have to be, as you mentioned earlier, on premise to do. If you're dispatching mm -hmm. truck drivers and you have to collect paperwork from them and everything else, you got to be there to do that. And most of those people have right. probably been there throughout this entire pandemic anyway. But I think yes. the point is valid. I think that, you know, times have changed. I have always been an advocate of telecommuting for those that are responsible enough to actually get their jobs done. Right. And I think that's really what it comes down to is it's, it's not just personal preference, but is how you, you know, how you work. Some people need that atmosphere, group atmosphere. It, it's like the old days in, in high school, et cetera, when you have a group project, right? You, you get around that and then there's, you know, put all your heads together and things get done to a higher degree than if you're absent from one another doing the same project alone. But then there are other things where your, if your own internal business ethic is really good, then at home works terrific. And so, so I hope we, I hope we answered that. Okay. For you, Ryan. And, um, I, I hope for your sake, you know, you miss that group in that atmosphere. I hope you get a chance to, to get back to that. We got another one here from, I'm not sure if it's Mandel or Mandel a, and it says R R T X. So I, Texas. I'm not sure what city that is. I assume it's Texas, maybe round rock or something. I, I don't know. I used to know geography really well, but uh, who knows. But um, it, it says, uh, I don't know what or what or who to believe anymore. Oh, oh boy. I'm not sure what this is. What are your thoughts on whether workplace will require vaccinations of employees before returning to offices? Well, that kind of goes with the, in a little bit with the one above it, depending on the type of work you do, right? And there's, there's a lot out there that's going on from a, from a political aspect or a scientific aspect of how do we get to herd immunity? We did a podcast a, a month or two ago about getting to herd immunity and some of the things that are going on there. I, I mentioned this briefly during that podcast that my belief is in certain industries, you know, we kind of go back to what we talked about a minute ago with warehouses. You know, they're talking about indirect source rule with emissions. Well, what if that warehouse is, believes their guidance is that not only does your truck have to be a certain emission level or you pay a penalty, but that your drivers that come in must prove they've been vaccinated to be able to get out of their, their cabs. I mean, that, that's a perfect, mm -hmm. for instance, in our, in our field. So the employers of those drivers are going to look at their their swath of employees and say, okay, you know, I, I know there's hesitancy, vaccine hesitancy. I know there's a lot of different debates around all of this, but if we want to get back to quote unquote, forget the normal part of your life and everything else, I'm talking about the business part. If you want to get back to the normal way of doing business with the clients and the vendors and the shippers and receivers that you have, then you might have to have that proof. I wouldn't be surprised at all. I mean, if you, if you are hauling hazmat, you have to prove that you have certification to haul hazmat. You know, if you, if you're doing different things, it, it's another certification. So I, I do believe man, Mandel that there are going to be workplaces that require it. And I'm also sure that there will be some that will leave it up to the, the decision-making of the individual, which may drive the thing that Jennifer was just talking about a few minutes ago in terms of working from home versus going into office. It may be that Ryan from Gardner there uh, will want that group and that atmosphere to go back to the office, but may only be allowed to do so after he gets a vaccination. So I, I hope we answered that for you. Do you have anything to add to that, Jen, at all? 
It also depends on um, whether this is a private or a public company. Uh, I know somebody who works for a private company, which is not in the transportation logistics industry. Um, they work in the like technology um, tech sphere. And they were told you can come back to the office starting, I think it was June 1st, as long as you can prove that you're vaccinated. Um, you don't have to, but then we can't have you at the office. So they did that exact thing that you had just said is they, they offered their, they uh, said, you can come back if you show proof of vaccination. If not, then we can't have you back. We're going to ask that you continue to work from home. So it, but I think the, the difference here is it also depends on where you work. There are different state laws. You cannot be fired as far as I know from a private company because of this. Um, it also depends on any future um, legal litigation that goes on. I don't know. It, it changes every day. It seems like the effort, because uh, right now they do not require, they strongly encourage, but they don't require medical professionals to get the vaccination, but they definitely very, very heavily um, encourage it. So even uh, even in that case, we're not we're not quite there yet. But I don't know that could change. Um, it just really it, again, it depends on exactly what your job is, and it depends on specifically where you work and what that company's yeah, structure yeah, looks like. I, I think that that Jennifer's right on the the money here with this, but I, I I'm with you, man. I don't know who or what to believe anymore. And I think to Jennifer's point, I don't think that's an uncommon. I think it's very, as a matter right of fact, now. I think it's most common. It's like, I, I don't know, flip a coin. I, I, yeah. in, in what you said a moment ago, most of this stuff is driven by litigation. You know, there's a, there's a CYA aspect to a lot of things that businesses, insurance companies, et cetera, all that are going to be involved with this kind of subject have to adhere to, to continue to do business in a way that's profitable in right for their own company and the, the people that invest in their company and their employees and everything else. So there's a lot of complexity to this. And this is, this is kind of new. This isn't 1918 anymore, right? So the, the way we're handling this in general, whether you look at it askance or you doubt this or you believe that, it, that's inconsequential. The, the fact of the matter is, is these kinds of things change the way we go about doing a living. Just, I know it's different, but frankly, like 9-11 did. It changed the way... It's changed the way you walk through an airport, right? Completely. But nowadays, you don't even think about it anymore. There was a time, just mm -hmm. as a short aside, there was a time when my wife and I took a vacation. This is 90-something, 1990-something, whatever it was. And we were able, my wife is very gregarious. Everybody loves her. And she was chatting with the, the flight attendant. Next thing you knew, she was in the pilot's in the cockpit with the pilot looking at stuff. Her dad used to be a, be a, be an airline pilot. Uh, so I, I, you would never see anything like that today. They, they, you know, there's a, there's a barrier that you couldn't, you know, get through if you even tried anymore, but that's, that's an aside. This life changes and you have to deal with it. So great, mm -hmm. great question though. And I understand what you're talking about. We got just a couple more to get through here real quick that are on this list. So let me, uh, let me jump to the next one. This is Jacob L from Parker. Uh, again, I'm not sure where that is, but I know there's a Parker, Arizona. I don't know that's what this person is from, but it says, you mentioned that drivers need to be treated better and be at the center of a company other than more pay, which, you know, everybody at every job wants, uh, what do you propose? Wow. That's, probably too big for this as well. But just to give you a, a real quick kind of summary, again, this this is probably from the podcast they did that I think, I think it was called Drivers Want to Drive. And you can look, by the way, any of these up on our YouTube uh, channel, uh, Jaws Bites. That's J-O-Z and then space and B-Y-T-E-S. And there's a whole series of videos that, that we came out with over the last few months. And the the... The context in which I developed that particular video or that podcast, which you can get on Apple or Spotify or whatever, was is that you know pay is always a component during driver shortage, which is a huge driver shortage now. I think the average age of 
drivers in the United States, long haul drivers in particular, is well over 50, which is kind of amazing. It shouldn't be that high. There's some real veterans out there, and that's great. But um, it, it's that's that's the way it is. But but I think developing concepts around your driver employment side and understanding that while technology seems to be at the forefront of everything we talk about, there's always a high tech aspect of, of supply chain, big data, analytics, you know, massaging the, the information to try to develop how your network's going to grow. All those kind of things are important, but there's a high touch aspect. And in the trucking industry, that hard t- high touch aspect centers around the people that deliver and pick up for you. And that is the driver. Mm-hmm. They are, you know, a primary central focus of how trucking gets done. Everybody knows that intuitively, but they oftentimes don't develop a business around that. So that's what I'm trying to instill. In, in, as far as you know, other things other than the pay is always a component of it. Maybe frequency of pay is an important part because it's, you know, do you get paid once a month, once every couple of weeks, once a week, do you get paid on demand? You know, there's a lot of different ways to do things today where a driver can rapidly get their bills paid for by getting the pay they put in the, the, the day before or the week before to them right away. So that's part of it. But I think the, the other part that I, I kind of think about the most is not just Benny's and things like that, but developing a, a, a I know it sounds like I'm talking about a strategy and it really is that, but developing your ability to, to understand where your business is going but individualize your dispatch relationship with your drivers. Drivers are human beings. They're not autonomous yet, right? They're not robots. And they each have a, a, a life situation that they're trying to advance. They're trying to get home to their, their kids and their spouse, you know, every night. Or if they're a long haul, maybe, you know, twice a month for long weekends, or they want a longer vacation period or you have to have flexibility. I think that's a key to it all. Uh, so Jacob, that, you know, again, that's a, something we could develop at another time, but that's kind of what I'm talking about. It's not just the pay. There's got to be other things. And then as far as the industry is concerned, the industry itself has to be more understanding of what the drivers have to do. You know, there's hours of service you have to deal with, electronic log data uh, um, that they have to adhere to now. There's a lot of regulations. And when you go into, say, a big warehouse and you're lined up down the street with everybody else and you're not being prioritized because the warehouse has key performance things they're trying to get to, if they change even slightly how they develop their, their intake or you know, for lo- unloading or loading process to get those drivers in and out quicker, that's driver centrism. That's, that's allowing the drivers whose time is incredibly valuable not just to their company, but themselves. It, it changes the whole equation. And, it, and it, if you can become more efficient by doing some of the things we're talking about in the industry, then you will create a, an entire additional percentage of drivers simply because they have more time to actually be on the road and do what they want to do, which is what I said in that podcast. Drivers, they want to drive. So I'm going to um, zip to the next one real quick. We just got a couple more to go through for this particular mailbag session. Uh, This, this person is, uh, no, I hope, I hope he wasn't named by his parents this, but Roadkill Ray. And he says he's from America. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, Can you guys do something on our, oh, on our need for better trained commercial drivers? That's interesting. She's, he says, I, I've been doing this for nearly 30 years and some of the guys should not be out there. Uh, and that's kind of ties into our last one a little bit. There's, there's a lot of real veterans that have been doing this a long time out on the road. And they, it's, it, believe me, if you've gone down interstate highways, you will see truck drivers that you, and you can tell the real professional CDL guys and the ones that are right out of trucking school because... <laughs> You've got to be, you have to have your head on a swivel today. These trucks are, you know, there's 80,000 pounds typically of, of truck, trailer, and freight in these things. And your car doesn't stand a chance. And safety is paramount. That's why there's ELDs. That's why there's hours of service restrictions. That's why a lot of that stuff is in place. 
So, and the first thing that comes to mind with this question to me is, I think the, the last, I think it was already taken care of, but one of the proposals that was going through the FMCSA advisory board in the last year or so was getting long haul drivers uh, at the age of uh, before 21 years old. And that was a big hmm. point of contention amongst the driver pools that are out there because they basically are saying, hey, that's that's too young for this type of driving. There's certain other types of driving that need this, this longer haul type of driving. And that kind of feeds into what Roadkill Ray is talking about here. And But that's just one thing. I, but again, these are pretty broad subjects. I hope we're, we're hitting them just for a second or two on this. And I, I don't, you know, from your perspective, Jen, and... I know you don't deal with drivers on a day-to-day -day basis, but hey, you're like everybody else. You're out on the roadway and you see these kind of things going on. What is your perspective on, on what Ray's saying? Well, I think of it like a doctor. You know, you want your doctor to be a well-trained doctor. You don't want your doctor to have gone online and, well, maybe this isn't the right example because there's lots of people in med school who had to be online the past year. <laughs> I'd like to hope and think that they were some pretty intensive uh, work they did online and then when they were able to go back in it was hard hardcore catching up but I mean I, what I mean to say is you don't want someone who took a 30 minute course on just reading Wikipedia pages on heart disease and then go in and have them do your heart surgery you know what I mean this so so I roadkill Ray or I'll just call him Ray he uh he has a good point you you want really well-trained drivers out on the road because uh, just like a doctor takes care of, you know, your health, you want to make sure that, you know, these people are taking care of your goods and supplies. I mean, who gets those things to the hospital? The driver does. Who gets the the lumber and materials to build your house to the place where the house is built? The driver. I think people overlook um, just how many semi trucks are on the road right. just just to use semi trucks as an example i mean the second you it's it's like when you get a new car and you suddenly realize all the cars on the road that are the exact same make and model as yours you you see them more often well when you start to actually focus on drivers you realize just how many of them are out there and they're integral to our society and keeping everything moving more now than ever it feels like especially this past year and uh I, I, this kind of goes back to the last question I think about the driver centrism or centrism, excuse me. But these are the backbone of the entire industry. I mean, you wouldn't build a building without the people with the hammer and nails who are actually doing the physical work. The executives and the accounting and all these people, they're integral too because they 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 manage all the outside stuff that keeps it as a business entity, but you have to have a service, you have to have a product. And in this case, this is a service-based industry that moves product. So the people who pr actually perform the specific service, they're key, they're important. And um, I feel like sometimes they're overlooked in the entire question of, of what's needed for the industry. And, and, that's, and that's, that's honestly, that's not the right way to, I mean, your th way of thinking about it is correct. The general way that people think about it is not enough. It's, mm. oh God, there's another trucker out there. There's, you know, that, that is kind of one of the motivations around this website entirely is to try to change that perception. And it is changing. I've noticed that the people are paying more attention to the logistics supply chain world out there, of which transportation and trucking is a very integral part of it as well. Um, but, you know, and I think to your point, you, you wouldn't want a truck driver operating on you, right? For, for you know, a, a heart attack or whatever you had. And you wouldn't want a doctor jumping into a big rig to deliver your freight. So that's, that's kind of, kind of sums it up in a nutshell. Very good. Very good. Um, we have one more here and it's from Carlos, Carlos O from San Luis Potosi. So this is uh, uh, one of our uh, Hispanic amigos and oh boy. Um, you know, while, while I look up the translation, can you attempt, I think you have this in front of you now, uh, can you attempt to read this question? Read the question? Yeah. In Spanish? 
Oh boy, well, excuse me if it's not great. I'm learning and I really do want to learn. So this is just practice for me. So don't tear into me too hard. <laughs> um, oh boy. Necesitamos más información sobre los negocios en, en México y lo que está sucediendo aquí. Me encanta tu entrevista con Jesús más, más, más. So basically, oh, they're saying uh, okay. that yeah. they, they love okay. the interview, interview with Jesús. Yeah. Oh. The one you did with the... Um, yeah, I got the moss, moss, moss part down, right? I knew what moss, moss, moss. But, you know, that... Oh, that... pardon me for that that no, terrible was, attempt. I think that was pretty good. It I need good to, to practice. Me, but... I really want to really get good at it. So this well, is my you are in Southern California, so it's, it's almost... Uh, it's, it's almost it's important. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, it's and, important. And, you got to learn but, your Spanish. Additionally, what's important is that and we're trying really hard as a company to make sure that we participate in, we're down near our Southern border. There's our number one trading partner in the world for the United States is Mexico. There's, mm -hmm. you know, every car make that you can think of that you could buy here has plants down there one sort or another. The, the interview I did with Jesus a month ago or so, was a lot of fun and and he he told reminded me of some things that I knew and he taught me some things that I did not know about the way they're building infrastructure on there to coordinate and really have kind of a, a north south conduit all the way from Mexico through the United States into Canada to really bring them together our continent in a way that the Burlington Northern Santa Fe and the Union Pacific did with the East Coast railroads, CSX and NS and things like that back east. So it's really creating a, well, like I said, a, a broad infrastructure. And mm -hmm. it was very interesting to me as well that it wasn't that long ago the Panama Canal uh, increased its size to allow super vessels through there, something like the Ever Given, mm -hmm. by the way. And, but the, I don't think the Ever Given could get through there. It's too big but at this point. But... Mm -hmm. It's a different type of cargo anyway. But one of the infrastructure things he was talking about was actually competitive to that in a in an east-west corridor around the isthmus down there. So having said that, Carlos, I'm glad you loved that interview. I, I think maybe I need to get a stand-in and do some of these in, in, in Spanish as well since, you know, I can, as, as I joke about, I know how to order beer and you know, find the bathroom in Spanish. That's that's pretty much it for me. But uh, but stay tuned because there will be much more. And maybe if if Jennifer gets her gets her fluency down, maybe she'll be the one conducting those interviews. I don't know. But uh, yeah, I, you know, I do want to learn. I do yeah. want to learn. Well, th that's that's about it for this this session today. Except that we had one little note I wanted to add to it. And, I thought it was hilarious because I, I think this to myself and this this person, it must be a moniker online. It was called L O V one, L O V O one. In in this person, whoever he or she is, says, dude, get a better camera. <laughs> I I totally yeah. concur with that because some of the things we're doing again from home, like right now, this is on one of those Teams Zoom slash conference call kind of things. And the resolution right. is mm -hmm. eh. So we're working on it. You can probably see I've yeah. got a decent microphone. And, and I know that anybody out there is probably has one last thing in their mind when they're watching this. They're looking at your background, Jen, and going, what is that weird oh. gold thing with? Uh, yeah, <laughs> what is that in the background? You've got to share. If I, if I turn it, here, I can turn it. Oh, it's like stuck to the table. Oh, okay. Okay. It's a elephant. elephant. Obviously not real. I do not participate in that, but oh, it's a, a fake elephant head. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's good. it's just a adornment. I've actually been rearranging. You can't see there's like a lot of chaos going on just out of frame. You can see my my college degree is just peeking out of the corner right there. But um, I've been moving my office around because I'm I'm home for the long haul, it looks like. So I've been moving things around, trying to get 
things situated in a way I like in the house. So this is my new uh, well, desk adornment over here. Well, I guess at this point, I will end up bidding you and your elephant friend adieu. And thank you, by the way, again, for participating in this, in this uh, first of the, the mailbag, I, I guess we'll call it, um, episode. Um, and uh, I hope everybody enjoyed it out there again. As far as a plug is concerned, go to our you know Apple Podcast, go to Spotify, go to YouTube channel, go to our website. You know, again, www.ilevellogistics.com and sign up for the daily. It's It's been a tremendous benefit for, for people I've talked to. It grabs stuff from all over the internet. And, it, you know, we, I kind of view it as this is a way through a company like ourselves here online, through all these media methods to become kind of self-certified, if you will. You know, there are a lot of things you can learn out there, but everybody's busy. They need they need quick information coming at them. They need to be able to scan articles, and this will allow them to do that. So join us out there. Become part of the community. You know, subscribe. Get, get in there and uh, dig into the information and help your career along. Uh, who knows? You may end up being an entrepreneur and, and getting into that side of the field as well. But the logistics field, supply chain field is growing all the time real important and I, we love your feedback so please give us more and more and more again jennifer thank you very much thank you